Welcome back to another episode of the Marketing Stuff Podcast. Today, we're going to continue on in our marketing foundations to make sure you are building your marketing career on a solid foundation. So we're going to get into notes and we're going to move on to the next section. How are regular folks like you and I that aren't blessed with massive marketing budgets supposed to compete in spaces that take a ton of money, a ton of time, and a ton of resources, all while trying to stay sane? That's the question. And on this podcast, we're here to help you find answers Welcome to the Marketing Stuff Podcast. All right, so if you have not seen or listened to the first episode where we talked about the first chapter and kind of what this is all about, make sure you jump back and you watch that because this is a continuation and week over week, episode over episode, these are gonna build on one another. So we have about seven learning objectives that we need to get through. We're gonna define marketing strategy. We're gonna describe the elements of a marketing plan. We're going to analyze a marketing situation using a SWOT analysis. We're going to describe how a firm can choose which consumers group to pursue, outline the implementation of a marketing mix as a means to increase customer value, summarize portfolio analysis and its use to evaluate marketing performance, and describe how firms grow their business. Okay, so there's quite a bit. So let's talk about what marketing strategy is. According to the textbook that we're referencing, it identifies a firm's target market a related marketing mix, and the basis on which the business can build a sustainable competitive advantage, okay? Listen, the way I think about marketing strategies, it's a high-level approach for promoting, gaining attention, or selling a product, service, or idea. This is the foundation of your marketing plan. So let's connect it to the simplified definition of marketing that we talked about before, right? It's an approach for reaching the right people with the right message at the right time and place. And we talked about the simplified definition of marketing in the previous video. So let's talk about the different ways that we can deliver value to the customer, okay? There are four key methods or four key models that we can use in order to deliver value to a customer. So that can be customer excellence, operational excellence, product excellence, or locational excellence. Now, It's important to understand that as we start talking about these, in most cases, in most cases, you cannot just pick one and let that kind of be the way that you set yourself apart or go about delivering value to your customer. You typically are going to have to be good in multiple areas, and then you're going to have one that really just shines through and like this is the thing that you're good at. If we're being honest with ourselves, we have to be effective at pretty much all of these, right? We can't have one that's like absolutely horrible and expect that we're going to be very successful in our marketing efforts. So when it says these are the four ways you can deliver value and essentially select one, and that becomes your sustainable competitive advantage, what we're really talking about is how do we improve each one so that we are meeting the standard? And then how do we make one or two of these be the thing that we build as the pillar of our sustainable competitive advantage, okay? So customer excellence, that's when a business creates value based on retaining or providing outstanding service. And we know businesses that do this really well. The Roots Carlton is an example. Nordstrom is an example. Zappos is another good example. And then Disney would be another example. Okay, so when we talk about providing outstanding customer service and then my students talk about Chick-fil-A. So these are all companies that that's what they're all about. They're all about providing outstanding customer service and that's the way they stand out. Now, each one of these, they also have really good excellence in other areas, but this is what we remember them for. Okay, retaining loyal customers is the objective of keeping people on longer to increase our lifetime value, which we'll talk about later on in our 10th episode or uh, 10th week, if you're following along week by week, and we'll get into lifetime value and really nailing that equation and talking about how that should affect your thinking as a marketing professional. Okay. And the importance here is when we start thinking about customer excellence, it's not just about providing excellent customer service, and it's not just about retaining loyal customers. We also have to realize that the way our customers perceive the interaction can add direct value to the bottom line through longevity, but also through physical evidence. Probably back in 2014, 2015, Google released the conversation around the zero moment of truth. And essentially what the zero moment of truth said was that we originally thought about marketing as stimulus. 
search for a product and buy the product and then experience the product. And those were like the way we kind of thought about marketing. Well, later we realized that really what it is is stimulus, experience or interaction with someone else's opinion. And that's the zero moment of truth. Purchase or engage with the product, experience the product. And so it's this right here that, that tells us that this customer excellent piece has so much value when we start thinking about how do we determine what our sustainable competitive advantage really is. All right, operational excellence. We have to make sure that our supply chain is efficient, that we're working efficiently. Listen, we can have some of the best food in the world. We can have some of the nicest people in the world. But if you go to get a deli sandwich and you have the best sandwich and you have the nicest people, but you're waiting for three hours to get a turkey sandwich, it's very unlikely that you're going to be as successful as you could be had that sandwich only taken 15 minutes to make. Where's my sandwich? Okay. So this operational excellence piece plays into a lot of the other components because people are only going to give you so much of their time before the other components, the value that you're able to deliver in the other areas is just not enough, right? It's just not enough. Okay. Product excellence. Focus on achieving a high quality product, effective branding and positioning are essential. So you'll notice that right here, there's a definition of branding. This is from Marty Neumeyer and it's essentially like a brand is a gut feeling. And I, and I want to reference that because when we start talking about what is branding and positioning, well, you need to know what these are to really talk about like what this product excellence is. We'll talk about positioning here later on, but that's what we're really talking about. Effective branding, effective positioning and delivering a high quality product. That's when we get that product excellence. Okay. There are a lot of brands that stand on product excellence. Apple is one Hermes, the lipstick brand, which my class and I talked about in chapter one. If you're interested, I would do a quick Google search of Hermes uh, lipstick company and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. And then we have locational excellence. So it's a method of achieving excellence by having a solid physical location and or solid internet presence, okay? And then again, just this note here, in most cases, you won't be able to build a sustainable competitive advantage just off one thing, right? So good. So now we're gonna move on to describing the elements of a marketing plan. And that's just a written document that really describes how you're gonna achieve your income results, okay? how you're going to go about getting customers. And it's broken down into three phases and five steps. Remember, three phases, five steps. Okay, so the phases are planning, implementation, and then control. The planning phase is part where we're going to do like the strategic piece, figuring out what we're going to do. Implementation is where we're going to apply it. And then control is where we go back, we review it, see what needs to be changed, change it, and then repeat the cycle. Okay. So let's talk about each one step by step. So step one, we have to define the business mission and objectives. So we need to complete our mission statement and then we need to determine the long-term objectives of a business. Many business owners will try to skip this step, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it still gets skipped. Step two, we need to conduct a situation analysis and we'll use a SWOT analysis to cover areas of opportunity or we can use a CD step to assess the opportunities and uncertainties in the marketplace. We'll talk more about this later on. It's very similar. It's like a pestle analysis. Okay. And we're going to bold this. So we will get into this in future weeks, but just know it's very similar to a pestle analysis. And if you don't know what that is, I'll just do a quick Google search and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. So then when we're talking about our SWOT analysis, we have to realize SWOT stands for strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, strength and weaknesses are internal opportunities, threats are external. So you're trying to see where am I strong and weak on the inside of the company? And then where am I essentially, what are the problems that I'm going to face externally? Opportunities and threats. Well, not just problems. Where can I stand out? My opportunities. And then where am I threatened? Okay, my threats. All right. So moving on to learner objective four, describe how firms can choose which consumer group to pursue. This is when we start getting into that implementation phase. And then we're going to really be looking at like, okay, so Step three, we need to identify and evaluate opportunities using segmentation, targeting, and positioning. And I said we we're going to talk about positioning before we really get too much further. 
positioning. We have a little definition down here. If you want this document, we'll make sure that you're able to get access to it by going to Maurice A. Davis forward slash vault. So you can get this information and the notes. But positioning is like creating context and the prospect's mind to help them identify and answer basic questions about you, your product, service, or ideas. Okay. And this comes directly from Obviously Awesome. Uh, this is a book about positioning. If you're interested, I would say go check it out and you want to learn more about positioning. Her book's fantastic. The additional context up here comes from the book Positioning, The Battle of the Mind. Both really great books, probably the best two books that I've read on positioning. And we highly recommend them to anyone that is curious about positioning. Hey, Maurice here. Different Maurice than from the show that you're watching right now. Uh, if you want access to all the resources that I'm talking about and you don't want to have to write them down, in the notes below, you'll find a link. If you register there, I have included all the resources that I talk about inside of this free database. Uh, it's yours. So get back to the show. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so segmentation is breaking your customer groups or the larger group into small sections. Now, when we think about it from the standpoint of like, I'm creating my market plan, in most cases, when in this context, we're saying segmentation like, trying to find the area of the market that we want to target, right? And so it can appear that segmentation is an external thing, something you do before you start marketing. But in truth, segmentation is a continuous effort to figure out where people belong in micro buckets, okay? So you're trying to group consumers who respond similarly to firms' marketing efforts. So I don't want you to think it's a one-time thing. It happens all the time. So even on YouTube or on any of the podcast uh, networks, when I put up certain content and certain people respond a certain way, and then I put up different content and that group of people, some people like it, some people don't, that is a form of segmentation. I can start to see who's engaging with what and which components of the content that I create or the assets that I produce actually generate of results. Okay. Then once we do that, we move down into targeting. This is actually picking the group that we want to go after and saying, this is where we're going to put our efforts. And then positioning, we said, is creating that context in their mind so they can answer basic questions about us. Then we move on to step four, and that's implementing the marketing mix and allocating our resources. When we talk about marketing mix for the context of this, what we're talking about are the four Ps, uh, value creation, value capture, value delivery, and then value communications or communicating value. And that's product, price, place, promotion. We talked about this in the last week. So if you want to get into this and you're like, oh, I need more context, jump back, watch week one. And then that's, we're creating our integrated marketing system. And that's the representation of the promotions that we're going to be doing using our marketing mix. Okay. And if we want to make this a little more simple, it's really, how do we bring together all the pieces and create something that is going to be the most impactful possible for our marketing efforts. That's really what we're saying here when we're talking about integrated marketing communications. How do we go out and do this marketing thing and actually get people to raise their hand, sign up for our stuff, okay? And then in step five, we talk about evaluating performance and using marketing metrics, okay? So we need to know, this is why we in step one, we set goals, we need to know like, are we hitting those objectives? And if we don't have metrics or we don't have things that we're going to measure, it's gonna be very difficult for us to know if we're hitting the metrics. So some things that we need to understand is that leaders should be evaluated based on factors inside of their control. This is not always the case. So if you are a marketing leader, you might be evaluated on some stuff that you can't control. But here's where we get that caveat. Even when the fault lies outside of the business's control, leaders still have options. And so sometimes you're going to be measured on the options that you take. It's important to note that several factors impact a business's performance. And then leaders should use multiple metrics to determine performance, including financial. Okay. So when we're doing this marketing stuff and we're measuring, we need to have both non-financial metrics and financial metrics to say if what we're doing is successful. Okay. So now we need to summarize portfolio analysis and evaluate marketing performance. Portfolio analysis is just evaluating the different businesses, product services, or offerings to see which ones are the most profitable. And so when we say like product line, we're talking about a group of items that are associated with one another. We see product lines with like Pepsi. Okay. 
the different multiple flavors of Pepsi. That's a product line. And then our strategic business unit is like a small group inside of a larger business that sometimes has a different mission and can operate independently of the larger business. Okay. Now, some tools that we can use in order to measure is the Boston Consulting Matrix. It's been around for a long time and seems to not be going anywhere. And so there are essentially four quadrants that a product strategic business unit or service can fall into when we start looking at this. And we base this on relative market share and market growth rate. Okay. So relative market share, let's see if I can, if I can increase this a little bit, because I don't remember exactly which axis is which. I think this is, yeah, this is market growth. So high growth, high relative market share. That's what it is. Okay. So our stars over here, high growth, high market share. Then we have our cash cows, which are low growth, high market share. Then we have our question marks, which are high growth, low market share. And then we have our dogs. This is low growth, low market share. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that any of them are not profitable. We just have to understand what it is relative to the market. So when you have stars, these are going to require a fairly large investment, but they oftentimes stars will become cash cows later, which means that it requires much less investment when the market starts to slow down in growth, but we're making money hand over fist. Okay. Question marks, on the other hand, how they differ from stars is that typically you don't have nearly as a solid position and the product or service that you're thinking that you're evaluating is probably underdeveloped and will require even more investment in order to become a star, which still could require additional investment. Question marks can be highly profitable, but they can also be highly risky. Okay. And then finally, we have our dogs. That's low growth rate, low market share. These, in most cases, we're just going to let them die. That doesn't mean we stop doing whatever we were doing, right? Like we could still be making money, but it's probably not worth the effort that we're putting into it. And so we're just going to kind of let it do its thing. And when it stops, it stops, right? Dog for me was, I used to do like Google My Business Profiles. I had relatively low market share and the market growth at that time was relatively slow. And so I would get you know, five or six a month. And then I just kind of let them do their thing and then I'd let them die, right? So that could be an example. Here's the thing, red flag. Hey, red flag, red flag, everybody. <laughs> That's why it's in red. This is a great mental model of how to review a business portfolio, but it can be very difficult to actually use in the real world, okay? Because some of the information that it asks you to get can be challenging to find, especially when your competitors are not publicly traded. Just know, really amazing mental model to think about a business, but maybe not the best way to evaluate a, a portfolio, trying to do it from a data perspective, okay? All right, so describe how firms can grow their business. There are four main growth strategies. And again, you typically pick one of these and you try to drive it home. So the first one is market penetration. That's a growth strategy that employs the existing marketing mix and focus the firm's effort on existing customer groups. Okay, so it's like, I got this. I'm gonna try to deepen the relationship and make what I got bigger. Market development, a growth strategy that employs the existing marketing offering to reach new market segments, whether domestic or international. Okay, so this might be, I make Pepsi and I used to only sell Pepsi to single moms. And now I realize that single dads really like Pepsi too. Okay, so that would be market development. I'm going to take the same product. I'm going to take the existing offering and I'm going to Try to position it in such a way that I can now talk to a different group and say, hey, you like this too, okay? And then product development, this is offering a new product or service to a firm's target market. So whereas before we're taking in market development, we're taking an existing product and offering it to a new market. This is taking a new product and offering it to an existing market, okay? 
Then finally, we have diversification. This is where we introduce new products or services to a market that is not currently being served. Okay. So this may be related diversification. So I already have the new product or service offering that I'm putting out is connected to what I already offer. So in, in the Pepsi situation, I might offer snack food because I found that when people buy a Pepsi, they also buy chips. And so I also create chips. Okay. So related. Unrelated might be something like, you know what? The childcare market is booming as Pepsi. We're going to open up our own brand of Pepsi branded child care centers. And that would be an unrelated diversification. It's important to know that like the unrelated diversification, while there are businesses that pull it off, Procter & Gamble uh, would be an example. They have very unrelated diversification. Well, now in reference to one another, they're related because they have so many organizations. But from its onset of its strategy, I would say it was very unrelated. Unrelated diversification can be very risky because you oftentimes do not have enough context in that market to know exactly what you're getting into. It can require a ton of resources and you can make a ton of mistakes. So these are some downsides to the unrelated diversification. So, all right, that is chapter two of your introduction to marketing. If you have any questions, feel free to send me information. Outside of that, that's all I got for you today. If you enjoyed this episode, please let me know. Like this, share it with a friend, family member, or someone you know that's thinking about getting into marketing or maybe a college student that's currently taking marketing classes and just needs a little more help understanding what they're getting into. Again, you can grab the notes. The link to this document is inside the show notes below. This will have way more information in it as far as the vault. I'm putting together just a bank of resources that young marketers, new marketers can use to become more effective in their marketing career. So I hope you find this helpful. Outside of that, stay out here, y'all.